all counts, too. What happened yesterday is part of today and tomorrow. We look at the miracles of modern progress in terms of overwhelming industrial facilities. We think of it that these are no more than just the tools with which to do a job. If you want the real story of what we're doing today, you've got to look beyond the walls of factories and laboratories to people. People with ideas, skills, and experience. Yes, and something more. Something that is not easy to define, but it's very real. And it started a long way back, in 1869, during the era of Reconstruction. If you remember your history, you'll recall that those were dismal days. It was freely predicted that the nation was headed for disaster. Lift up thine eyes. Huh? To what, I ask you? Wish I could have stayed in Grant's army. At least a man could eat. Pessimists whispered that the pioneering was over, and industry would never survive the disruption of the tragic war just ended. It's gone about as far as we can go, and there's no place to turn. In the Rochester, New York office of Western Union, a young telegraph operator named Enos Barton was impatient with the faulty performance of the telegraph equipment of that day. Young Barton had ideas, secret ambitions, one of which was to buy a partnership in a model shop in Cleveland, Ohio. But there was also a girl, Kitty Richardson, and good reason for holding to a steady job in those uncertain times. But like many men ahead of him, and since, Barton learned that no secret is safe from his fiance. Before he realized it, he confessed his ambition, and Kitty had won his promise that he'd let nothing stand in his way. Then later that evening, at a church meeting, but I say to you, the frontiers have no limits except those that exist in the mind and spirits of men. There is more need for pioneering today and tomorrow than ever before. Pioneering in thought, pioneering in problem. We prove we have the courage to follow the flag and offer our lives in the staggering horror of war. Now have we the heart to win the peace have we the vision to dream and the strength and faith to make those dreams come true? Barton answered the challenge. He invested his own savings and all he could borrow in the Cleveland model shop. Here, he helped bring to reality the dreams of many struggling inventors. Among them, one Professor Elisha Gray. But while Barton was always willing to pour his ingenuity and sweat into promising ideas, his vision and enthusiasm were not always shared by his practical-minded partner. Are you and that moonstruck professor still tinkering with that thing? It makes a sharp thing. A printer telegraph that really works. Never has so far. I'll stick to the real business of this shop, repairing machinery. If you've got time to waste on fellas like this, Gray, well, then there's another crackpot inventor waiting out front. Want to see him, too? Of course. Who is it? I don't know. Some young fellow named Edison. Yes, it was Thomas A. Edison. But in those days, he was just another telegraph operator with ideas, looking for help to the working mud. But when he heard of Professor Gray's latest development, Edison put aside his own project. Would you like to see it? My guy? Uh, I mean, uh, well, would, it, would it be all right? Of course. We were just about to try it out. And frankly, I'm a little curious to see whether it works. Barton, somebody else to see you. Just a moment, Mr. Shaw. Ready when you are. As soon as I connect it up. That kind of nonsense goes on all the time. You have some invention, too? Uh, no, it's a personal matter. I'll wait till he's disengaged. You're likely to wait a long time. Why don't you bust right in? I'll wait. All right, Professor Gray, we're ready now.
It's working. It's coming through. This should be a proud moment for you and the professor. Come with me. I'll show you the transmitter. Gentlemen, you've, you've been very kind, but you have another visitor. Oh, that's right. Excuse me. Oh, Mr. Edison, would you like to see how this operates? I, yes, I would. You see, this ratchet is gone. I feel like a fool. Hello, what's this? Mrs. Barton and Gray, you and your wives are invited to dine at my home Wednesday evening. Signed, A.S. Very gracious of them, I'm sure, but who's A.S.? General Sager, vice president of the company. Oh. Before that dinner was finished, General Sager had decided to join with the professor and young Barton to form a company, a company whose principal assets were imagination and courage and faith. A year later, the firm of Gray and Barton was operating in Chicago. But success didn't come immediately. People resisted change. Even progress. But the Chicago fire, tragic and terrible as it was, proved something of a blessing in disguise. It gave Chicago a new birth. And Gray and Barton, whose plant had miraculously escaped and was now known as the Western Electric Manufacturing Company, contributed greatly to the modern city that rose from the ashes. By 1876, Western Electric had grown to considerable importance. A brilliant young inventor, Charles E. Scribner, was now collaborating with Professor Gray on new developments, some of which were beyond the comprehension of even General Steger. One was the harmonic telegraph. No better than any music box. General Steger, if we can reproduce the human voice in song, why can't we transmit speech? Instantaneous conversation over a wire. You can do that? Not yet, but Professor Gray believes he now has the answer to how to do it. Talking over a wire? Barton, this is important. It must be protected. Professor Gray was in Washington at the patent office last month, and he's there again today doing just that very thing. In fact, he should be there at this moment. Well, why didn't you take care of it long ago? Perhaps we, like yourself, were a little slow to recognize its full implication. Only tomorrow's weather, unsettled, followed by storm. Barton, we're on the threshold of the greatest development in communication in the history of man. Nothing must be spared to push this. But just a minute, there's more, a news flash. The patent office in Washington announces an improvement in telegraphy which will make possible instantaneous transmission of speech by wire. It is claimed this device will permit two-way conversations over distances reckoned in terms of miles. Let me have this. This is writing history. The inventor of this revolutionary instrument is named as Alexander Graham Bell. Bell? Alexander Graham Bell won recognition as the inventor of the telephone. But the years of effort by Professor Gray and his associates were not wasted. As the telephone displaced the printer telegraph, the men of Western Electric focused their energies on the broader future. One of these was F.R. Wells, formerly Mr. Barton's secretary, now his assistant. Then, one day in 1881, in the executive offices of the Western Electric Company. Well, you've tried them both. Which is better? Well, hey, this one by far. You can hear more distinctly, and it's a better job in every way. 
Yet actually, they're both Bell instruments, made according to Bell's design. The only difference is the one that you prefer was made by Western Electric. What's that thing? Just sort of an idea for a quick make and break connector. Nothing really important. Well, this is important. How long will it take you to disconnect it and pack it up? An hour or less. Do so then. We'll catch the afternoon train to Boston. Boston? Yes, to Boston. We're going to call on the Bell people. Ahoy there. Can you hear me? No need to shout, Mr. Bell. I heard you perfectly. Just as you hear my voice. Gentlemen, I'm glad I happened in this morning. That's demonstration enough for me. If Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Vale are convinced, then I am. Well, for my part, I'm satisfied, and I see no reason why we should not join forces to devise and produce new and finer... Oh, one moment, gentlemen. Uh, before Mr. Bell's enthusiasm carries us all away, there are some things Mr. Hubbard and I would like to discuss with the General and Mr. Barton. Yes. Dull, practical things, like manufacturing costs and quantity of production. Well, of course, I uh, have our figures right here. Well, in the meantime, uh, perhaps Mr. Scribner would like to see our switchboard. I would, very much. Rather impressive, isn't it? At least that. How many telephones have been installed? A few over 900. All this to handle only 900 telephones? Yes. But one day you'll have many thousands of subscribers right here in Boston. What then? That now becomes your problem. It's very impressive, Mr. Fair, but what is it? Well, this is a new switchboard for the Bell people. It replaces a whole series of boards. Yes, and it can be operated by one man. The entire thing, right from where he sits. Oh. More important, it can handle calls just as fast as they come in. Really? Let me show you. It's uh, really no trick at all. Never mind. This fumbling could be quite serious. It means mistakes, wrong numbers, delays. Maybe this board is too compact. Nothing of the kind. It's simply that your fingers aren't educated to this sort of thing. Let me try. You should have had training with a needle and thread. Just as you said, no trick at all. It's amazing. Nonsense. Any woman could do as well. Any woman? Of course. There's not such a blow to masculine superiority. Any woman? I wonder. <laughs> Within two decades, Western Electric was not only the principal supplier of telephone equipment in the United States, but also, through the pioneering aid of F.R. Wells, had established this new medium of communication in many other nations of the world. Yes, I guess it may be said that we've grown to worldwide stature. But we've merely scratched the surface. We'll need much more production than our present capacity if we're to keep pace with Mr. Wells' ambitions abroad. I suppose so. But size itself is not a goal. That day we first met the Bell people, some 25 years ago. It wasn't our size that was impressive. We were small. But we made a better telephone. We gave better service, and every step since has been directed to that objective. That's why we shouldered the job of installing our equipment ourselves, to 
make certain that it delivered its best service. We took on some headaches, too, as our installers occasionally remind us. Yes, it hasn't been easy. Nor was it easy to assume the supply contracts for more and more telephone companies. But by shouldering the responsibility for purchasing and for warehousing, distribution and repair of equipment at our branch houses, we've given better service. We've saved the telephone companies and the public a great deal of money. When you stop to think of it, that's quite a commentary on American business. Here were two concerns who a few years before had been rivals on the same development. Yet now they were cooperating in a perfect example of team play for public service. By now, the way ahead seemed clear. But then came the financial panic of 1907. In the New York office of Western Electric's H.B. Thayer... I can't understand it. This country, with all its prosperity and resources, facing a financial crisis. Yeah, perhaps it's just growing pains. A nation becoming adult. Surely nothing's more vital to progress than the telephone. Yet, because of this crisis, the weaker companies may be completely wiped out. Whole sections of the country may be without service. Well, it's such a long-range operation to invest millions today to be paid back in nickels and dimes over the years ahead. In these times, long-range vision isn't the best collateral. Banks can't foreclose a mortgage on social progress. But there must be someone. There is. That is for Western Electric to pledge itself to support those companies. And that, of course, involves a risk. Perhaps a very grave risk, but, uh, well, that's the way it has to be. The telephone companies must not be killed off. Mr. Barton, we know how you feel. So we're taking that gamble. Now we stand or fall with the telephone company. You did the right thing. We've come a long way since those days. And every mile post along the way, every achievement has been further proof that the frontiers of progress have no limits. Each new development each step forward merely serves to broaden the horizon of future opportunity. By 1917, plane-to-ground and plane-to-plane -plane communication had become an accomplished fact and paced the way for modern skyway traffic. By 1922, the Western Electric System of radio broadcasting was in operation. And in almost no time, we learn to expect the finest of the world's entertainment delivered to our living rooms. 1926, silent movies came to life. By 1927, radio telephones spanned the Atlantic with regular commercial service. Nobody called it a miracle. It was taken for granted. In their crude and cluttered workshop, Gray and Barton had pioneered the hard way. But through the years came progress in the ways of progress. Cooperative research, steered into definite channels of scientific exploration, replaced the hit or miss methods of chance discovery, speeding the advance of all civilization. The modest plant which first bore the name of Western Electric grew to nation with manufacturing plants, each employing tens of thousands. And still other thousands, skilled installation men, complete the process of manufacture in central offices all across the nation. And in 29 of the principal cities of the country, distributing headquarters were established, linking the nation together in a vast network of supply. A giant production and service institution designed and geared to the performance of a single job, supplying the needs of the bell system, that set the tempo of American business, that speeded the output of the greatest producer nation on earth, that carried the casual conversation of social and community life, or a mother's frightened voice in the middle of the night. That was our peacetime job a job on which we of Western Electric had concentrated with a single purpose for three generations. And then, overnight, we were at war, a war we were not prepared to fight. Still fresh and bitter, 
are the memories of those days. The frightful race against time as we train civilians to be fighting men. The desperate demands for fighting equipment. We Western Electric men and women remember who were in it from the start. Our first assignment was communication. Maintaining the nerve system of the arsenal of democracy. Communication. Directing the battle of production. Carrying the endless tactics of turning out ships and planes and tanks and guns. Communications. Translating headquarters strategy into battle action on a dozen hard-pressed fronts. That was our first assignment and one that we could swing into immediate performance. But there were other assignments, far more important. Top priority in secrecy and urgency. Secret weapons of almost incalculable complexity and ingenuity. Electronic brains for the advanced technocracy of modern war. Instruments and devices so new that they existed only on paper or as an idea and a prayer. That became our most vital job. A job so vast and intricate, our enemies thought it couldn't be done. A job we didn't know we could do until we did it. Through months, while Americans fought a desperate rear guard action, our production facilities had to be transformed. Whole sections of factories, which for a generation had specialized on one job alone, were cleared of existing facilities and changed over to new and totally strange production procedures. Even under the flaming lash of war emergency, it was a slow process. But it was accomplished, and our fighting forces began their offensive. Now please understand, we at home don't pretend to be heroes. Compared with the performance of our fighting men, Ours is a pretty humble job. But only the fighting men know the full extent to which the telephone service has been transformed into a fighting weapon. It's out in the Pacific, giving eyes to the fighting ships, training the guns and transmitting battle orders. It's in the sky, too, in the dive bombers, fighters, and scouts. It goes in with the Marines and GIs, coordinating the teamwork of amphibious assault. On D-Day, it helped pinpoint Hitler's impregnable defenses and aim the guns that tore them apart. On a hundred fronts all over the world, the instruments we built for better living have been changed into miracle weapons for defending our way of life. War has disrupted our normal way of living and brought serious inconveniences. Some people are having to do without telephones. Before all can have telephones, the intricate, complex equipment that goes into modern central offices must be made in great quantity, installed, and interconnected to the system throughout the country. Much of it is unlike what we've been making for war means another huge job for Western Electric. And it's a job that can't be done overnight. Yet Western Electric, drawing upon its years of experience, the new skills acquired during the war, and its great tradition of service in meeting emergencies, will do its part to see that no American home waiting for Bell Telephone service need wait one day longer than necessary. This is another challenge to Western Electric. A challenge as great as the one Enos Barton faced 75 years ago. Now have we the heart to win the peace? Have we the vision to dream and the strength and faith to make that dream come true? It was faith made alive and strong by courage and purpose that brought us up the long, hard road to today. And under God, shall carry us through to a greater and brighter tomorrow.